One of the places that nested for loops really shine is in the processing of any type of data that is itself two-dimensional. Okay. Now, let me go back to our suit pick assignment that we saw previously. Okay, so recall here was suit picks. This was the whole thing of dealing with the PPM files and all of that. Um, and so you had these various things, right? And remember, I mean, basically it shows that essentially these are really, gr this is a grid of information. Okay. Now the PPM files are not unique in this. That is that pretty much every um, image format uses, or any every bitmap image format uses this type of layout. That is this grid structure for an image. So anytime you're dealing with an image, you're really dealing with uh, this sort of grid of data. Okay. Now if we fast forward to the current project, um, namely uh, project one, where uh, you have this PPM lib folder um, or project. Okay, so what I did is a couple of things to help us uh, take a look at this. Okay, so if we take a look here, I have this file uh, faperu.ppm and the first thing I'm going to do is to just drop this into uh, into the ppm lib folder here. Okay, and you'll see I already have a bunch of ppms. I'm going to resort this by a date modified. That way I'll be able to see the most recently changed items. Um, and if I open this up in Irfan view, uh, I get this picture. If you've been to the Broward website recently, you've seen this. This is for uh, this is the ad for you know studying abroad in Peru. Um, I've just downloaded it off of there, opened it up into Irfan view, and saved it as a ppm so that uh, so that I can use it in this example. All right, from there, I'm just going to go to uh, Visual Studio Express. I'm going to say Open Project Solution. Um, here I'm already in my folder, so I'll go to PPM Lib and I'll grab the SLN file. Um, and now we have that open. If I spin these open here, uh, we see we have a couple of CPP files. The PPM CPP you can ignore. That's simply the implementation of the, of the PPM library that you're given. Card maker, on the other hand, um, is where your code's going to go. Okay, so if I open this up, um, and let me go ahead and auto hide this so we have a little bit more room to see this, we can see we have the actual code. Okay, now the PPM library that you're given makes accessing the PPM files much easier. Okay, so recall um, if you scroll down, you'll see this PPM lib docs, and if you go to if you click on that, you basically get this link. Okay, it tells you about the two different things that you have to access. There is a PPM class and there is a pixel class. Okay, so a PPM um, notice can be created by specifying a string, which is the file name, um, or you can just create one um, blank and then say load that up. Okay, there's save as, get height, get width, etc. Okay, let's take a look at using this. Here's some actual code. The code that's already in CardMaker shows some examples of how to uh, how to use these things. Um, so, uh, so I'm just going to kind of edit out some of these things. So I'll leave in the loading message because we'll probably want to see that. Um, take that out, and um, I'll leave the load part and so forth. Um, I'm going to get rid of most of this other stuff. Um, again, you'll probably want to actually uh, read that code in yours, um, but for this example, I don't need it. Okay. Now, instead of loading up um, spade.ppm, what I'm going to do is load that uh, that Peru picture. So it was fa Peru dot ppm. Okay, and what I'll then do is to say. Um, pick has width of get width and height of get height and end the line. Okay, let's just see if we can load it up and read out the values of its width and height. Okay, so when I go ahead and run this, okay, 
runs, it says it's loading, tells us that it has a width of 628 and a height of 308. Now, certainly this picture is small by today's 5, 8, and 10 megapixel standards, um, but it is definitely larger than the, uh, than the card parts that you're, uh, that you're dealing with. That's okay. Okay. It does give us um, does give us quite a big range of uh, pixels to actually deal with, and that's kind of the point. Okay, now I can verify that all this is true as well. Um, if I go back over to my desktop here, here's the original image. I right. show you I'm not cheating, um, and the original image is 628 by 308. Okay, now let's suppose I wanted to uh, to write a program that actually did something to every single one of the pixels in that image. Um, maybe we want to, for instance, add to the greenness or decrease the blueness of the image or whatever. Um, or we could even convert this from a color image to a black and white image. Um, if I wanted to do that, I would have to process every single one of those pixels. How many pixels are there? Well, we can easily calculate that. Okay, there are... pick.getWidth times pick.getHeight pixels in the image. Okay, so let's see how many pixels there are. Runs through. Notice we have over 193,000 pixels to actually process. That's a lot of pixels. That's a lot of coding. That means we definitely want a loop. Now, to process all the pixels, we can simply start at the upper left corner of the image, that is the pixel with X coordinate zero and Y coordinate zero, and just work our way down through all of the columns in every single row, okay? So, let's take a look at that, right? First, I'm gonna have one loop that deals with the rows themselves, okay? The vertical locations of the pixels. The vertical locations, the up and down locations of the pixels are the Y values. So I'll call my loop variable Y. And as we said, it's gonna start at zero, okay? Now, as long as Y is less than the height of the picture, we'll keep moving our loop and our increment is to simply add one to Y. And I'll even put in a little comment here so that uh, so that it'll become so that it'll be clear how the loop is uh, is how the nesting structure is working and for why. Okay. Now inside the body, okay, when I'm looking at a particular row, say row zero in the beginning, um, now I need to process the individual columns. That means another loop. For int x equal to zero while x is less than pick dot get with x plus plus. Okay, so now what we have, um, again, and for x. Okay, so now whatever we do in here will be done, um, or can be done to every individual pixel. Okay, let's do it in stages. So, I'll say, pixel or ridge is equal to, um, and again, if I go back and take a look at what I can do with PPMs, I notice that there not only there's our get width and get height like we saw before, but there's also this get pixel function, right? Returns the pixel at the specified coordinates. Okay, so I come back over here and I can say pick dot get pixel at x comma y, right? Our x and y are our loop variables. Okay, so that grabs a hold of the pixel. Now, suppose I want to alter, let's just say, let's say to keep it simple, we're just gonna decrease the amount of red in the, uh, in the image. So what we're gonna basically gonna do is just decrease the, um, the red component. Okay, so I'll say something like um, current red value is equal to, and now orig.getred, okay? 
So I get the uh, current value of red and I store that in cur red. Okay, then I'm just going to create another variable. And certainly I could probably do this um, a little bit easier with not quite as many variables, but uh, this general, this helps be very explicit about what we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to say new red is equal to the cur red times 0.3. Okay. Of course, this is um, this is in fact going to result in a floating point variable, right? Because we are actually um, we're multiplying by a decimal point here. Okay, so what we can do is to do our static cast int of this. Okay. Now, so I've computed the new red value. Next thing I'm going to do is create my new pixel. Pixel, new pixel, um, is a pixel that um, has a red value that is new red, has its um, has its old value. It's it's the green value is orange dot get green, and its blue value is orange dot get blue, like so. Okay, so this says new pixel and is basically calling the constructor that takes three integers, um, a red value, a green value, and a blue value. Um, finally, we can go back to our picture, pick, and say set the pixel at x comma y to be this newly created pixel. Now, having done that, what we probably want to do is after both of the loops are done, that is after we've made all of the changes to these pixels, we're going to save this um, as a separate image. So I'm going to say pick dot save as, okay, and I'll call it fa, oops, underscore peru underscore less underscore red ppm. How's that for a nice descriptive name? Okay, so we do our save as, and let's go ahead and try this out. Okay, says all of that, there was that many pixels, and press any key to continue. Okay, so let's see what it did. Okay, if I come back over here and uh, do a refresh, there is my FA Peru less red. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, it looks more greenish and bluish, which is what you would expect if you reduce the amount of red. Okay. Let's just, uh, we'll go back here and take a look at this again. Okay, so you'll notice that basically all I'm doing is I've created these loop variables, x and y in this case, to, uh, to me, because they, uh, they have meaning in, in the context of what we're doing, right? The question was, well, I see i's and j's, why i's and j's? Again, the loop variable can be named whatever you want. These could be foo and bar, they could be rows and columns, however you want to, uh, to name it, that is up to you. i and j tend to be used very commonly for nested loops, um, especially because you'll oftentimes see programmers when they create a loop, they'll start off with int i equal to zero, um, and so then the next letter in the alphabet alphabet is J, so then if they're nesting in, they'll, they'll use J, okay? Typically being very lazy and not really using particularly good variable uh, naming, okay? But you get the point here that, uh, that here we have um, the naming of our variables related to, uh, to what it is that they are supposed to do.